I'm joined in studio by Andre Dumise. He is a contributing editor at McLean's Magazine and the author of the Washington Post opinion piece titled Canada is Not the World's Moral Leader. Just look at our newest scandal. Andre, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So uh, we were talking before we got on air about your piece sh sort of shatters two different ideas. The idea that Trudeau is this kind of far leftist mm -hmm. and the idea that Canada is this moral leader. So... Coming at this, so you referenced a New York Times piece. So kind of discuss this this weird idea that Americans have about how Canada is sort of this this leader now that Trump is kind of you know well it, it's, it predates Trump I think by by quite mm -hmm. a stretch I think it actually goes back to the uh, the George W Bush years I lived in the U S uh, for several years and you know, people would ask me when I was there you know a lot you know isn't Canada so much better why wouldn't you want to go back there I mean you guys have free health care and there's no racism and they just they would just like list off everything that was bad about the United States and then be able to find a counterpoint in Canada and I'd have to explain to them like this is this is not your utopia and I, I think. Unfortunately, what Nicholas Kristof, the author of that uh, New York Times piece, did was operate off of that rubric of Canada being this social utopia that the United States should aspire to. And it's it's lazy and it's 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 pedestrian. Mm -hmm. If you look at the problems that we have in this country, we've got, you know, a, a problem with income inequality. We've got problems with racial disparity. We've got problems that, that are gendered. We've got problems that have to do with uh, trans communities. I mean, we've got the very much the same problems as the United States. As a matter of fact, I would say one thing they do better, though, is that they are able to track what the problems are. They have enough data to back up and say, well, here, here are the discrepancies between the dominant culture and marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Canada, we don't do that. So to say that we're a moral leader, like we can't even figure out how bad our problems are to be able to solve them. You, you can't claim moral leadership until you can do that. So do you think that's the source of this misinformation? Because I do find that even our own media... We almost aren't as critical, or we definitely aren't as critical as we should be about what is happening in our own country. Do you think that that's the reason why there is this mis this misconception uh, through uh, Americans and and even other countries? Oh about my gosh, we've Canada? we've had this problem for. I mean, it, it, it practically predates uh, the, the Confederacy. Like the the um, we don't like to look at ourselves. We like to look at ourselves in relation to. Uh, so you know, uh, in the post World War One period. We looked at ourselves very much in relation to the mess that was uh, post-war Europe. We look at ourselves in, uh, in relation to uh, post-Civil uh, War United States. We've, we have a very difficult time um, exercising introspection in this country, mm -hmm. right? So and what I'm looking at right now and what I tried to look at through this piece is how can we claim moral leadership, for example, when there seems to be basically two tracks to the justice system? So for your average Canadian who is not ultra wealthy, who is not well connected, doesn't have the right political connections. The laws apply just as they're written. If you break the rules, you're going to be punished according to what the law says. But if you are ultra wealthy, if you are well connected, if you happen to be a company like SNC Levelin, then there's a separate track available for you. And it, you know what it's increasingly looking like, I want to be very careful with what I say here, but what it's increasingly looking like is that there are people in the halls of power that will go to bat for you, that'll try to create loopholes for you. And that's, mm -hmm. that's to me, it's completely immoral and defeats the purpose of a democracy. Yeah, so let's discuss the, the snc uh, uh, Lavalin case a bit, because it does appear that corporations, or at least you know a large corporation like snc Lavalin that is based in, in, in Quebec, that they have the ability to put pressure on our government, whether directly or indirectly, just through the amount of power that they hold mm -hmm. as this massive corporation in in Canada. So um, how do you apply what happened to, to SNC-Lavalin? How do you apply that in the sense that it, it exposes our failure as a, as a nation in terms of our uh, inability to be a moral leader. I don't think that SNC exposes it. I think it just sort of adds to the pile of evidence that was already there. You know, I mentioned in the article, for example, that uh, after the Panama Papers dropped, at least to my imagination, I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is a complete scandal. There, you know, there are several organizations, uh, corporations, wealthy and powerful Canadians that are named in these papers uh, that have basically hidden their wealth offshore so that they're not contributing. And I thought that there probably was going to be, uh, you know, an investigation. There was going to be prosecution that the Canada Revenue Agency would go after these people. And what essentially happened was the bureaucracy and, uh, you know, the government, and I would say to some extent the media, basically mm -hmm. shrugged its shoulders and moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, uh, the the Paradise Papers dropped, which named over 3,000, again, individuals, corporations, foundations, etc., uh, the exact same thing happened. We were just, mm, yeah, well, I guess wealthy people don't 
pay their taxes and that's just the way it is and that's to me that's not a that's not a sign of a, a healthy and functioning democracy so what do you think the the problem is here so is it i mean uh, I would put a lot of blame on the media. I mean, yeah. that's how I perceive it, because I feel like it's, it's the media's job to really push the government on these issues and inform the rest of us. But also, there does seem to be a lack of a, sort of a, this grassroots movement or like a, a progressive leftist movement to, to push our media and our government on these issues. Whereas I feel like it, the U.S., even though they have you know, a long list of, of problems, right. they do have now, at least even on a, a national scale, they have leaders like Bernie Sanders or AOC who are actually raising serious issues with the, the, uh, the amount of concentrated wealth and power that's in the system. And we don't even have leaders like that here. Do you think that's part of the problem as well? Yeah, the United States does have a, a you know, long and healthy tradition, you know, going all the way back to like Eugene V. Debs, for example, uh, of, of people who will hold the wealthy and powerful to account and understand that the purpose of a government is to serve the people. In, in Canada, on the other hand, and there was, I believe it was the National Observer, but I could be wrong here. There was an article that recently came out basically saying that uh, the Canadian economy is essentially managed by a few very large conglomerates, of which SNC-Lavalin happens to be one. Mm-hmm. Um, I would venture to say also that, uh, you know, the Canadian, Canadian media is managed by a few very large conglomerates, of which News Talk 10, 10 happens to belong to one. Yep. Um, and you can see how the uh, the coalescing of interests between the two parties, you know, uh, uh, certain political parties in government, um, large corporations and large uh, media organizations, you can see how their interests align. And that's why stories, I think, like this go away. So until we develop uh, a health, not just, you know, a party system, but until we develop a healthy dialogue among politicians who operate within that party system that can call the powerful to account, then this is all that we can look forward to. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I almost understand it in the sense of when it comes to to uh, to money and and corporations, but I mean to to have an issue like our our arms deal with with Saudi Arabia, something that is so you can have the you see the images from from the war in Yemen, and it's something mm-hmm. that should be able to elicit some kind of reaction from people, and it's uh, an issue that I I think the media should be more focused on. But it seems like even that, e- even an arms deal with with the Saudis, yeah, it sort of gets brushed over. Well, look at it. Look at it this way. And uh, I'm not trying to conflate the two. I'm just uh, here's what I'm saying. The, here's how I, I can best illustrate it. So, the premier of Ontario, uh, it was either this afternoon or yesterday, but uh, yeah, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. Uh, cheered on the uh, the yellow vest convoy that's going to be coming to Ontario, and that is what we see as being a. Uh, your regular working class movement, that there are people who are arguing for the building of pipelines and to be able to save jobs, which just happens, again, to align with large and powerful corporate interests, especially at the expense of violating uh, or possibly violating treaties and intruding on the territories of First Nations. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you have this, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this arms contract that we've had with the Saudi Arabian government that we sell them uh, light armored vehicles. And when asked whether we were going to invoke the Magnitsky Act, uh, which is basically an act that you know, if a uh, for, if a foreign government is uh, essentially uh, killing whistleblowers uh, to uh, to prevent uh, truth and information from getting out, then essentially we uh, we levy sanctions against them. So when asked whether we're going to invoke the Magnitsky Act uh, to uh, cancel the purchase contract with the Saudi government, um, well, Minister Freeland uh, indicated that uh, we're not going to be uh, doing any more purchase contracts with the Saudi Arabian government at least temporarily. And the prime minister says, well, see, there would be penalties in the billions of dollars, and it's a lot more complicated than it sounds, which is basically just waffling and saying, yeah, they killed a journalist, but we've got, we've got all these billions of dollars to think about yeah. and these jobs to think about. So, again, it's like it seems to be this unidirectional conversation that everything boils down to what is in the best interest of the most powerful shareholders in this country. Mm-hmm. And if that's the way that we're going to run the country, we should just be honest about it. We're basically a corporatocracy, but if we're going to call ourselves a social democracy, then we need to act like it. I'm speaking with Andre Dumez, the writer of the Washington Post op-ed titled Canada is Not the World's Moral Leader. Just look at our newest scandal. So on that note, is it possible to have moral leadership within capitalism since capitalism is almost inherently exploitative? <laughs> is it even possible to have you know, a nation like ours, or especially, I mean, the U.S., and, but uh, I mean, yeah. any nation, is it possible to have more well, leadership you know, within I'm, capitalism? I'm going to take my cynical hat off for a second and say, <laughs> well, there are social democracies that uh, do, I think, manage um, their relationship to capitalism uh, at least more morally than we do. I'm thinking of the Nordic model, for example. Yeah. So Scandinavian countries, uh, especially Norway, mm-hmm. which has a very large oil reserve, 
um, you know, it has basically a public pension system. And when companies uh, they find are engaged in underhanded or, or possibly criminal acts, uh, they just cut them out of the pension system. They say, well, you know, there are, co- there are companies that we're going to support, companies that we're not going to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, out, another Canadian company, uh, uh, Barrett Gold, uh, was blacklisted out of their pension system because of the, uh, the practices it was engaging in, in, in the global south. So, yeah, there are ways that capitalism can be done in a moral way. I'm just very, very skeptical towards it because what I also find, and, and Mark Fisher wrote about this before his unfortunate passing, is that what capitalism does is essentially it, it just consumes, cannibalizes, and then reshapes itself to look like the resistance to it. So take that yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah. So uh, I guess you mentioned there, I was going to ask, are there countries that that are moral leaders? Do you think the, the Nordic countries are or, or could be looked at as moral leaders? In, they, I mean, they have their own issues, especially where it comes to uh, to immigration and, um, you know, uh, figuring out how it is that, uh, you know, uh, people who, who uh, have immigrated from other countries or people who are uh, refugees from other countries, um, how best to integrate them into society and uh, not create a marginalized group. Uh, marginalized groups. So actually, as a matter of fact, I uh, met the prince and princess of Norway a couple of years mm. ago, and we had a very brief conversation about this. You know, how is it that, you know, we can we can best integrate uh, newcomers to the country and not create uh, ghettos? Uh, so every country, like, there's no utopia that exists anywhere in the world. Mm. I just think that uh, when you manage it in the sense that you're you're looking at people, um, not just as voters, not just as stakeholders, but uh, citizens and human beings who have an equal interest. As companies that can throw all kinds of money at you for your uh, for your favor, if there if the interests are at least equal, if not more powerful inside of the voter, uh, the individual voter, then I think that we're moving towards that morality we're talking about. So, do you see any politicians in in Canada that may uh, potentially be able to lead on this? The- potentially be able to lead us towards Man, don't being put, don't put me in the hot seat on that one. I'm not <laughs> I'm not here I'm not here to, to promote politicians. No, just... but if you if you have any fine uh any party in mind or a, even even just okay, what well, would you want to see in a politician? Okay, so here's the thing. You know, uh being of Jamaican background, you know, when I was when I was growing up and I was a lifelong liberal voter until the, the last election, but you know, uh coming from the kind of background that I came from, mm-hmm. um it's, people from the Caribbean especially are very heavily geared towards voting liberal because it was the Liberal Party that uh, changed the Immigration Act that allowed uh, many of us and, and our parents and grandparents to move here in the first place. What I what I've been seeing happen, and it happened to our community, and I think it's happening to a much broader extent now, is simply taking voters for granted. Mm-hmm. I think the, for example, the PC Party of Ontario is doing the very same thing, where they have a block of voters uh, that have been with them, you know, since the 1960s practically. And they've begun to take those voters for granted to the extent now that they're antagonizing parents of autistic children. Yeah. You know, uh, do I think that there's any party that right now that that encapsulates, I think, that that morality that we're looking for? I don't think so. I think the Green Party is doing some very uh, good things, especially around raising uh, the alarm on the environment and Mm -hmm. what it is our our capitalist system is doing to exacerbate those problems. I think the NDP is capable of that. It's just that the party is practically eating itself right now so it's very difficult to watch so i i don't know as as you know not speaking from a political point of view but just speaking from the average voter point of view yeah. you know who would i cast my ballot for i'm finding it very difficult to figure that out right now i don't know yeah um last question how should we well, what's the best way to maybe educate people on these issues because uh, as you said the the uh voters in, in for the the pcs here in ontario i feel like there's a lot of misinformation there, especially, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. being on News Talk, this is largely a conservative radio station. I get a lot of callers, a lot of messages from people who really don't understand that this party is not working in their best interest. But it's almost hard to, to break through that. Do you do you have any strategies, any way to actually speak <laughs> speak to people who may be, you know, largely misinformed on issues? Listen, every time, every time I write a column, I get, you know, like a week's worth of hate mail. So I don't, <laughs> if there's a way to get through to, you know, to, to die in the wool voters, I, I haven't figured that one out yet. But I, what I will say, though, is that um, at least where it comes to me having conversations with people in person and on social media, I think, uh, at least from my experience, people tend to find my tone of writing way different from my tone of engaging on social media or my tone of engaging on a face-to-face basis and i think it's just meeting people where they're at like i don't you know i don't hate for example conservative voters i think that there are uh many issues that the conservatives have been able to uh obscure for your average voter 
that create some very weird ideas in their head, like all of the money that we're giving to indigenous people, for example, or that they don't have to pay to go to school, that we should assimilate them um, off of the reserves, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, black people are given, um, you know, all kinds of advantages in the society as far as affirmative action and welfare and so forth. So, but these are ideas that if you don't have a lot of contact with people who don't look like you or pray like you or think like you do, I, I could see how it's easy to get those ideas in your head. And, and I think for me, you know, for having a conversation with your average working class person to dispel some of those notions, it's as simple as sitting down and just saying, well, I, I mean, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Where did you get that idea from? Well, yeah, where, where's the information to prove it? And not in a, like a condescending and, you know, snobby way, but just to sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation with a person and, and help create a better understanding. That's just my approach. I'm not saying that this, this approach is one that anybody else has to take, mm -hmm. but the, the, the discourse that I see, especially online and especially in news media, it's just... It's confrontational on purpose. It's there to create a conflict to generate, you know, listens and paid, you know, to, to generate page views and clicks and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think removing ourselves from those venues and just having face to face and in person conversations goes a long way. Because at least in my experience, when I talk to people that are conservative and people that don't come from my community, we cr we create a pretty good understanding of one another, and, and we walk away from the conversation feeling good about what we said. Once we insert that conversation into like a social media sphere or into a uh, you know uh, in in front of the uh, the news cameras and in, in, in a debate forum, it doesn't work. It's it's yeah. not designed to work. Andre Demez is a contributing editor at McLean's Magazine and the author of the Washington Post opinion piece titled "Canada Is Not the World's Moral Leader." Just look at our newest scandal. Andre, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me.